welcome back to another one of Mr. Lang's vlogs. Today we're talking about World War One, or as was known back then, and still in uh, Europe for the most part, the Great War. Although we'll see that there's nothing great about it. Uh, let's go over some general info first. Uh, so first, to give you an idea, this war starts on July 28, 1914 officially, and ends uh, at 11 a.m. on November 11th, 1918. The 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, right? So first, we're going to go over the main reasons uh, to, for the start of the war. So I said main, I stress that, because it is, of course, an acronym. Uh, there really are four reasons that war was going to happen. And one thing is going to lead to a spark to set off all of these things. First, you have militarism. Militarism is where you, you build up your military or you glorify your military as a country. Now, these countries hadn't had a war in a while, and they had built up their militaries to a crazy amount of degree, and they wanted to show it off. They wanted to prove that they were the best. Um, you have an alliance system, which we're going to go over in the next couple slides. Uh, alliances were huge. Uh, we're going to basically have all the countries, uh, most of the big empires, are going to be allied with one another. And then you're going to have imperialism, something we talked about before where all these different countries were snatching up other countries and making them their colonies. What well, we're going to see, there's going to be a lot of competition between these countries to get these little colonies. That's going to lead to a lot of tension. And of course, nationalism. Pride in your country. We're going to see that these countries are going to have an immense amount of pride in their country. Again, Germans are proud to be Germans. Italians are proud to be Italians. And because of that, that's going to go ahead and definitely spark a wave that they want to prove that they are the best. So how did all this whole thing get started? Well, in 1882, Austria-Hungary, Germany, and Italy actually formed the Triple Alliance. They promised to defend each other, and if one was attacked, then the rest would come in to aid them. So this alliance lasted from 1882 right through to, well, during World War I. We are going to see that Italy is going to get out of this alliance, and they are actually going to join the Allied Powers. They're going to join the other alliance, which is this one. Um, you're going to have France and Russia and Britain join the Triple Entente. Now, they did not promise to help each other out, but together they encircled Germany and Austria-Hungary, and as well as Italy at the time. And really, that was huge because you know we're going to see that Germany and Austria-Hungary are, are going to be very distrustful of that. Um, and of course, with these countries literally surrounding them, they are going to be uh, basically kind of encroaching a little bit there, almost seeming like they're keeping watch on them. And so the Black Hand formed after Bosnia and Herzegovina were both taken under Austro-Hungarian control. Now that area was home to a lot of Serbian people, or Serbs, and so the Black Hand wanted to have independence for all Serbian people, and they were going to achieve that through any means necessary, including violence. And this is the spark that lit the fuse. Again, all those main causes are the powder keg, and this all it takes is one spark to go ahead and light this off. And it was. The one spark was the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand and the Duchess Sophie, uh, his wife. So they were actually going into the capital of Bosnia, which was Sarajevo. What, what ended up happening is they wanted to have a parade, a parade where they could show power and yet peace at the same time. And what happens at the parade is one of the most craziest assassination attempts probably in all of history. Uh, what we have is the Black Hand is at the parade. And when they're at the parade, as the Archduke and the Duchess are in their car, their convertible, going down um, the street, uh, the Black Hand, members of the Black Hand are throughout the crowd. They're watching. The first two assassins don't do anything. They, one claims, in fact, there was a cop nearby. The third one threw a bomb on which the Archduke actually batted it out of the actual car and it blew up behind him in the next car. Uh, that is a sign to stop the parade. Now the Black Hand members all had a cyanide pill, but the cyanide, the poison was old. And so when he bit down on it, he didn't die right away and he just has a really bad stomachache because he's running from the police um, as everything's just dehydrating. So what ends up happening is the parade's called off after that. The Archduke and Duchess are brought to the town hall essentially to go ahead and say, hey, we gotta get out of this like place. People are trying to kill us. And after they make it to City Hall, 
the governor and the Archduke make a speech, and they were going to go ahead. They changed the route to get him out of town as fast as they could. Problem is, the driver didn't know about the change in the route. And so the driver goes down a street, thinks he's going the wrong way, and so he stops and he has to reverse. Now, one of the Black Hand members, Gavrilo Princep, goes ahead and gets a sandwich. He walks out of the sandwich shop, he's eating the sandwich. And all of a sudden he sees the Archduke and the Duchess. He sees them, he goes over, he shoots the Archduke right in the throat and shoots uh, the Duchess Sophie uh, in, the, in the abdomen. And she died instantly. But the Archduke survived for just a few moments on, longer uh, to make his last words be, Sophie lived for the children, as he's choking on his own blood and he dies. And he goes ahead, he takes a cyanide pill, but just like the other instance, it didn't work. And so he's arrested. To make matters even sadder, this all happened on the Archduke and the Duchess's wedding anniversary. Yeah. So, there he is, Gavrilo Princep. There's the Archduke and the Duchess. And again, there's the assassination right there. And there they are hauling off, arresting Gavrilo Princep. And because of all this huge mess, Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia a month later. And now, the Great War has begun. So this was supposed to be a very quick war. In fact, Kaiser Wilhelm II, who was the, you know, think of him as the leader of uh, Germany, goes ahead and says, huh, you'll be home before the leaves have fallen from the trees. He couldn't be more wrong. Again, Germany planned to defeat France through what is known as Belgium, a country, a little country called Belgium, neutral country. This was called the Schlieffen Plan. And now what we see is, of course, uh, Germany is going to be going through another country to attack a country, right? So that's already just out of control, right? So how did this even happen? Well, there was a chain of events that led to the actual war. You first have, again, the Austro-Hungarian Archduke, um, again, assassinated. That leads to Austria-Hungary declaring war on Serbia. Now, Serbia is an ally of Russia. Again, they're all Slavs. They're Slavic people. So, again, if you go ahead and you attack little baby Serbia, big mother Russia's coming after you. So, what ends up happening is, because of that, Russia declares war on Austria-Hungary. Again, trying to restore balance in Europe. Don't have, you know, the big, this bigger empire, you know, beating up on little Serbia. So because Germany was an ally of Austria-Hungary, they get involved and declare war on both Russia and Serbia. And France declares war on Germany because of the Franco-Prussian War that happened prior to uh, all of this madness in the you know, mid-1800s. And what happened there was you know, France lost that war. They lost it. And so they were kind of trying to get revenge on that. And because Germany goes ahead and goes through Belgium, little neutral Belgium, Britain uh, literally had a, uh, a neutrality uh, agreement with Belgium that they would help, again, Belgium if they were neutral in any conflicts. And, well, now Belgium needs help because they're literally getting, you know, German uh, artillery just going right in their front lawn. And so Britain now joins the fight. So this is your Schlieffen plan, as we see the Germans go through Belgium. Uh, they, there was very, it was a very interesting move to do that. Uh, a lot of the reason why is because the border of Germany and France, um, you know, it's very much expected that they would attack there, as well as there's uh, big heavy forested areas like the Argonne Forest, which will be one of the famous battles that the U.S. takes a part in during this war. I think you can sign us to kind of see it here as well. All right. So we start to see these alliances really form and they really come down to two different alliances. And we like to, we like to give you acronyms, right? You know, main causes of World War I, right? Militarism, alliances, imperialism, nationalism. We got another acronym for you, and that's AHOG and FRUG. That's right, let me explain. So you have the allied powers here. That's gonna be one side of this war. France, Russia, United States, Great Britain. Take the first letters of all those, FRUG. Then you have Central Powers, Austria-Hungary, Ottoman Empire, and Germany, AHOG. Battle to the death, AHOG versus FRUG. Who's gonna win? Who's gonna win? Oh, maybe it's, I don't know, FRUG, who has clearly a black belt. He clearly has a black belt right here, okay? He's 
It's fantastic. So we see a lot of this warfare break out and probably one of the worst things that we see is on your screen right here, trench foot. Um, this came from very damp, uh, very flooded trenches as this war is mainly going to take place in trenches. Again, we're going to show you a picture, but essentially, you know, they're going to be dug in into the ground, um, one on each side. Um, you have no man's land. That's going to be the, the area between the two trenches, between the two enemy trenches. And of course, uh, this whole war is going to lead to a stalemate. That's where neither side can really gain an advantage of any kind. And so because of that, it really does just get stale. Think of it that way, stalemate. So this is what your trench would look like, actually in fact this is actually a pretty decent trench to be honest, um, where again you can see you have your soldier on lookout, um, that's always common there, uh, you you maybe um, sleep in a dugout which would actually be kind of uh, dug even further into the trench itself or sometimes you're, you're sleeping on the ground um, just waiting for an attack, again not a great way to live I'll tell you that. And again to give you an idea with good old MS Paint. Uh, this is kind of some of the things you'd have in that trench. You'd have your barbed wire. So, of course, if they did go over the top, which when they go over the top, that means the one side charges the other side's trench. Um, and when they do that, uh, hopefully they don't get mixed up in the barbed wire because that's, that's some dangerous stuff. Um, and then, of course, you have ammunition rack where you put your ammo, a firing step so, you, again, you can get up there and, and fire um, duck boards to help with any type of drainage. But in some cases they did, some cases they didn't. Um, you, don't, you usually have some sort of wood to strengthen it, you know, to keep from the trench from caving in, sandbags to catch stray bullets. Um, overall, very scary to be on the front line, that's for sure. And trenches were huge networks, mind you. Although I say front line, you know, there were front line trenches, there were support trenches, again, all interweaved and connected like a big old maze. Uh, it's, it's, it's something to see, I'll tell you. So, one famous battle, although we're going to go over a bunch of battles, um, is the Battle of Verdun. That's going to be France versus Germany, and arguably this is one of the biggest battles uh, between the two at, in this war. Um, it definitely is the longest battle, uh, and definitely one of the bloodiest. Altogether, going to have two million men engaged in battle during this entire uh, battle. Really, the intention was Germany really had been a battle of... Uh, a battle of attrition in which they hope to bleed the French army white meaning that when you have a battle of attrition you're trying to make the other side just use all the resources run out of resources so then you can go ahead and easily take them over in the end both sides sustained huge casualties which is you know killed wounded missing etc France had an estimated 348,000 Germany had an estimated 328,000, which is a ton, okay? And so, of course, here you can sort of see the battle lines, uh, where, where they were, where the trenches were. You can see where, you know, they'd gained ground, they'd lost ground. Um, what's even more, uh, you know, kind of impressive is that there's, in Verdun, uh, underground tunnels that, you know, the French did use, and eventually some of the Germans, too, um, to go around the city. Um, and you can actually go in those tunnels, as we will with uh, our Google Earth activity. So, like I said, a war of attrition really is you wear down, um, you know, you wear down both sides until one finally is forced to give in. They run out of resources, whether it be men, food, ammo, and they, they just have to give in. Um, one thing you're going to see with these next slides is that behind me right here is going to be propaganda posters. Propaganda posters are huge in World War One, as they're going to do basically be posters that are going to get you to well, want to help out in some way or make you against something. In this case, this wants you to join your country. When it comes down to it, these weapons are going to go ahead and define this war. Uh, these weapons are very deadly because they had advanced technology so much and they weren't really expecting how efficient some of these weapons would be. One of the big ones is gas by far. Again, gas was made up of different chemicals, and this includes chlorine, mustard gas, um, etc. There, there's different types of gas, mustard being probably the worst, as uh, it would go ahead and also have a chemical reaction on your 
your skin and you could have blisters uh, on your skin as well. So inhaling it is bad and even being exposed to it is bad. Um, you could be killed instantly and that's why one of the best sets both sides had was the gas mask. The gas mask saved lives. Uh, and of course, today, you know, chemical warfare is banned. Thank goodness. Then we have the tank. Our first time seeing the tank. And it isn't exactly the most efficient thing in the world, let's put it that way. Uh, it looks very different from tanks you're going to be used to seeing in World War II. That looks a little more familiar. You know, really they were made to go over the trenches, hence why they were very long. Um, they were very slow, though. They could travel three to five miles per hour, um, which is, you know, you're not getting away very fast than that. Uh, and of course, that made them to become really death traps in some cases, when artillery could just keep bombarding it, get through the armor, and then, you know, goodbye tank and people in it, unfortunately. One of the most deadly weapons that was very used was the machine gun. Now, this machine gun was different from something called the Gatling gun. The Gatling gun really was essentially 12 barrels from rifles, and you just crank it, and it just go through the barrels and shoot. Uh, that's really our first rapid fire type um, you know, firearm. Here we have something that can shoot 300 to 350 rounds per minute. Um, there's going to be many different types of machine guns. Um, probably one of the more famous is seen here, the Vickers machine gun that the, uh, the British used. But this is definitely one of the most deadly technology used here in trench warfare. As of course, it does fortunately rip through bodies. And then of course we have something that really we'd never had before, which was fight in the air. Uh, we have airplanes now. Probably one of the most famous is the Red Baron, who, again, shot down uh, estimated 80 Allied Powers uh, pilots. Uh, now, World War I really is the first to, to really have planes and, and, and warfare. They were used for something called reconnaissance, or recon, so they could see where the other side was by flying above. And it was also used in battles, in what we call dogfights, where you have literally planes battling one another in the air. Now, we start to shift towards the U.S., right? We're U.S. history, yet we haven't mentioned the U.S. at all during this. Well, the U.S. is going to start to become an integral part, because Germany starts to practice something called unrestricted submarine warfare. Again, they're Undersebootens, or U-boats, uh, are these submarines that are going to be literally torpedoing anything in the Atlantic Ocean and other oceans too. But for us, the Atlantic Ocean, because that's pretty close. And so there is a cruise ship that um, is called the, the Lusitania that would go, it was a British cruise ship that would go between, um, you know, Great Britain and the U.S. Well, it was sunk uh, by a German U-boat uh, without any warning. And Altogether, 128 U.S. passengers on board were uh, killed. Now, the reason why it was uh, torpedoed was the Germans claimed that there were weapons on board, again, in the cargo, and that the U.S. was lending these weapons to Great Britain to help the war, even though, again, the U.S. wasn't part of the war yet. So what ends up happening is, um, you know, obviously, Great Britain, U.S. say, hey, there weren't any weapons on board. You know, that, that's a civilian uh, cruise ship that you just sunk. It comes out that there were actually weapons on board after the war. Yeah, so they put those lives in danger, unfortunately. So what comes out of all this is after the Lusitania is sunk, after another ship, the Sussex, is sunk, uh, they come together and they make the Sussex Pledge. Again, Germany promises they won't sink any more boats without any warning. Again, they go back on this though, and around two years later they start to sink more ships. And when they do, Britain creates the convoy system. Now the convoy system is something to behold, I'll tell you. Um, they basically would have one ship um, surrounded by a bunch of battle cruisers um, that would go ahead and uh, escort a ship across the sea. So you wouldn't just have like one lonely ship going across the sea, you'd have all these other huge ships defending it. Um, and so, of course, this resulted in less damage from the German U-boats um, and really sent a message. See, and look at that, another, we've got ourselves another propaganda poster. Fight or buy bonds. Again, bonds back then are still like savings bonds today. You go ahead, you buy the bond for, say, easy, 
easy numbers. You buy it for 20 bucks, you wait, and say 20 years later, you can cash that bond in for 50 bucks. In this case, because there were Liberty Bonds, that money would actually go towards the war effort. All right, one thing I love to talk about is I did a lot of research in my master's program on this is the Black Tom explosion. July 30th, 1916, a huge explosion happens um, right in Jersey City, New Jersey. And it was an act of sabotage by the Germans. In fact, there were two German agents that blew up the American supplies, really a munitions dump, which is, you know, think of it as an arsenal. And what they did is when they blew it up, it actually rated a 5.5 on the Richter scale and caused even $2 million in damage to the Statue of Liberty. And the press blamed it on an accident. And they did that on purpose because they didn't want people to suddenly want to go ahead and fight, say, we got to go to war, let's fight. Instead, what they do is they say it was an accident. And after the war in 1924, um, they go ahead and it is, it is confirmed that it was uh, an attack by terrorists so yeah crazy stuff but even that that doesn't make us go to war it's this here the Zimmerman telegram or the Zimmerman note it's also called that is finally the straw that broke the camel's back Germany in 1917 needed another ally in the war they were struggling they were running out of resources running out of men and they looked towards Mexico right below the US border and they tell Mexico that, hey, you guys go ahead and invade the U.S. We'll give you, you know, you can take some of that land that the U.S. took during the Mexican-American War. And Germany promises all that back. New Mexico, Texas, Arizona, etc. It's intercepted. It's intercepted by the British. And the British go ahead and show us. And now there's no way we can go ahead and accept that. Especially because now the British know this. And Woodrow Wilson ask Congress to declare war. So Woodrow Wilson is the president during this war. In fact, he's president from 1912 all the way through to 1920. Again, he's, he's very well known for, he kept us out of the war. That was his campaign slogan in 1916 when he was going for re-election. However, after the Lusitania, after the Zimmerman Note, uh, Congress finally declared war on Germany, and he is going to be the president that enters the U.S. into the war. And of course, we have more propaganda posters. So you have ones that start to circulate around the US. Uh, again, together we win. Pershing's Crusaders, talking about Blackjack Pershing, we're gonna talk about in a moment. You know, don't waste bread. You gotta go ahead and be very resourceful. Um, even the civilians at home. So there's more for the troops to fight with. You have World War I propaganda where now they're starting to go ahead and some of them are making you against something, right? So you have be back the Hun in this case, again, which was a slur for Germans um, with Liberty Bonds. Or come on, buy more Liberty Bonds, help them out over there. Again, not enough men volunteered right away to join the war. Again, a lot of people still thought, this is Europe's problem, the U.S. shouldn't even be involved. So Congress passes the Selective Service Act. This required men between the ages of 21 to 30 to go ahead and register with local draft boards. Later, it's changed to 18 to 45 during the war. Today, it's 18 to 25. Uh, essentially, this is the draft. And of course, what more appropriate propaganda poster, especially during World War I, than this guy behind me, Uncle Sam. I want you for the US Army. And then you have Blackjack Pershing, who goes ahead, his name, his real name is John J. Pershing, but he actually goes by Blackjack. That's kind of his nickname. He's gonna lead the American forces, the uh, American Expeditionary Force, the e -A -A -E -F, over in Europe. Um, and he does a great job of it. Now, they are going to go ahead and, uh, you know, we're going to be referred to as the Doughboys in the trenches, if you will. Um, again, or the Yanks, again, the Europeans will call us. And we're, we're kind of seen as the, the rebel rousers a little bit, a little more reckless than the others. So here's your typical soldiers on each side. You have um, definitely the Germans there on the left. You can tell that's the, that's the early German helmet where you had the spike on the top, very reminiscent of the Prussian um, you know, which is where a lot of the Prussian uh, military had um, had become. And you also have, later in the war, a much, a much nicer helmet developed that's going to carry into World War II. Um, you have the dinner plates, which are, of course, what the British wore and eventually what the U.S. would wear. Um, but yeah, this is what the U.S. soldier was at first. Again, we were not prepared for this war at all. And so, of course, we are going to go ahead and have some supplies 
from Britain, such as, again, those, those helmets. So the war goes through, um, it goes on till 1918. We're not in there that long. Um, and the armistice is signed at 11 a.m. on November 11th on, in 1918. Um, and when you look at these losses, it's, it's sad. It's sad to see just how much this war really cost in lives. And so the war has to wrap up. And so a peace treaty is signed. It's called the Treaty of Versailles. Now, this really is the beginning of World War II right here. What happens at this peace treaty is going to lay the foundation for World War II. You have uh, all together um, four, the big four who's going to write the Treaty of Versailles. However, that's going to be even more limited down to really two by the time this is done. And I'll explain. First, you have David Lloyd George. He's going to represent Great Britain. You have Woodrow Wilson, who represented the U.S., Georges Clemenceau from France, Vittorio Orlando, who's going to be uh, representing Italy. Because remember, Italy was originally on the side of the Central Powers. They're going to join the Allied Powers. So, Lando's going to leave um, due to his needs not being met at the Paris Peace Conference, which is what this is, is called. Um, he leaves uh, Japan. Also, again, there was fighting in World War I uh, that the Japanese fought with us and the Allied Powers. Um, they're going to have their own battles over in, um, in the Pacific. They were also there. They're gonna, their needs are going to be ignored. Um, they're going to leave as well. Altogether, it's really going to be three. David Lloyd George, Woodrow Wilson, and, and George's Clemenceau. But even Woodrow Wilson, what's going to happen there is he gets sick. And we think he got the influenza during the pandemic. And when he returns to the table five days later, uh, he's still not rested. He's still not well. And we know that he came to the table with a lot of different ideas than he did when he first arrived. Wilson came with 14 points, 14 things he really wanted in this Treaty of Versailles. Freedom of the seas, so that we have no more unrestricted submarine warfare. Reduction of weapons all around from all countries. A fair adjustment of colonies, which would be more equal all around. Um, end to secret alliances. Respect for national self-determination, meaning that you can determine your own government that you want. Again, these countries should be able to do that. And the one thing he had, probably underlined, starred, circled, is a League of Nations. Woodrow Wilson wanted probably out of anything, a League of Nations, and he does get it. Unfortunately, Congress doesn't vote the U.S. into the League of Nations, and so although a League of Nations is formed, the U.S. doesn't join it. And what a League of Nations is, is literally a place where these nations can come together and discuss and negotiate uh, before acting rash and going into a battle, going into a war. And that sounds like the United Nations today, it's because it essentially was. It was much weaker though, as we're going to see, without a backbone, the League of Nations isn't going to work. Foreshadowing. So, our last slide here, the treaty, what did it say about Germany? How did Germany really, why is it that they didn't like this? Well, first, Germany had to reduce its army to 100,000 men, and they weren't allowed to have any type of draft of soldiers um, into their army. They had to reduce their navy to six warships and was not allowed to have any submarines. They had to destroy all of its air force. They had to hand over all of its colonies. They had to pay reparations to the allies for all the damage caused by the war. Again, that's $33 billion. They don't pay off these reparations until 2010. That's crazy. Uh, they could put no soldiers or military equipment within 30 miles of the east border of Germany, right in what they call the Rhineland, right by the Rhine River. Um, you have, they have to accept all blame for the war. This is what they call the war guilt clause. Think back, did they go ahead and actually start the war? No. This is something where they're, go ahead, they go ahead and accept the blame for a war that they didn't start. And the treaty overall was unfair. Germany wasn't part of those Treaty of Versailles, the Paris Peace Conference negotiations. Think about it. When you looked at that, all those, all those people at the Paris Peace Conference were the quote-unquote allied powers, the winners of this war. So 
there was no voice. Germany was made to sign this. And, well, in the end, it didn't take account to all sides. And what we see is a man by the name of Adolf Hitler that's going to use this Treaty of Versailles essentially as ammunition to go ahead and create a huge sense of nationalism against the uh, Treaty of Versailles, against the government that's set up called the Weimar Republic in Germany, and, well, against the Allied powers. Hitler's going to use just how much this document weakened Germany to go ahead and rise to power. Alrighty, and that's what we got for you for today. Thanks for joining me, and we'll catch you back in the classrooms.